Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the ruler of power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, doing the will of the flesh and senses. And we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Jesus Christ for good, good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we may walk in them. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of the scripture. Amen. Well, I do want to remind you that there are pads in your pews to let us know you're here today. Uh, again, I said this a couple weeks ago, and it holds true today. That's a great way for me to start to know the names that go with the faces. So I would love it if you would let us know you are here and there today. It would really serve me and bless me. So I hope that you will do that. Um, as we get together today and as we worship our Lord today, I want to remind you of something really powerful that you may not realize. You see, in the United Methodist Church, our local congregations, they give a tithe to the denomination. You may be going, I know, it's rough. Our budget's hard. But I want you to know something really amazing that I, about someone I talked to this week. You see, I'm part of the Children Matter Most team, which is a United Methodist, Indiana United Methodist team. And as part of the Children Matter Most team, I had the reason to be in conversation with um, the Basher Home, which is one of our children's homes in Goshen, Indiana. Um, and it serves young people. It also serves children coming out of human trafficking. And because you give your tithe of your gifts and your offering to your conference, they are able to care for children coming out of human trafficking. It's a connection you probably didn't know that you were in ministry to children coming out of such a tragic experience, right? But you are, by your connection in the United Methodist Church and your tithe. And so I wanted to share that with you today because as I was talking with that individual from Bachelor Home this week and having that little conversation, I went, man, if the United Methodists in this state had any clue the amazing ministries that they are doing by their giving on Sunday morning, I'm sure that their, their thankfulness, their hope, and their generosity would be blessed. And so I wanted to give those to you today as an offering. You are doing ministry with children who have been trafficked and have, been, have come out of that and have been led into a Christian community at Basher Home. So I give that to you as I invite you today to give thanks to our God for the provisions he makes for us and to give your gifts, your tithes, and your offerings to our Lord. And so I would invite those who are receiving our offering today to come.
receives our gifts and the hearts that give them and flourish them, Lord, for your kingdom work in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Please join me this morning in our singing our hymn, which can be found on num page number 176, Majesty, Worship His Majesty. It seems that we are kind of half and half, and some of us know this, and some of us I do not. So if you know it, please sing loudly so that your neighbor who may not can learn it. <laughs> No. Did that, been there, it's been years, I'm done. But it does mean that we all kind of shift gears, right? We're going to look for school buses coming through our neighborhoods as we get up in the morning. It means that um, as parents, our schedules do gain that consistency, which I'm very excited about. Um, it means that for our teacher friends among us, we're going to be uh, looking at a very different life and work schedule over the weeks to come. And so, uh, yeah. It's a reason to be in prayer. And so um, I remind you that, that back to school, while it may not be literally your path in life in this moment, it does shift our community. And so keep that in your prayer today. Um, well, and in the days and weeks to come, because it takes us really till Labor Day and that week after Labor Day to get our whole acts together, let's be honest. And the sooner school starts, it doesn't change the fact that it's still Labor Day before we have our act together. <laughs> Uh, but today we are talking about something very different in worship. Um, today we are still in the book of Ephesians. We're hanging out now in chapter 2. We made it to chapter 2. Are you excited? <laughs> Woohoo! Congratulations, you made it. Um, we might make it to chapter 6 by, you know, next year. No, I'm kidding. We'll be there this month, I promise. Um, but we are going to hang out today in chapter 2. And the words that Donna read for us are really powerful and important words for us to know as the people of God. And they are uh, they're pretty spectacular um, story that God has for us. It is a story that is often referred to um, by, in tradition, as the chasm of sin. It sounds like something from a Monty Python movie, doesn't it? The chasm of sin. But the chasm of sin is actually an understanding that we have as a people of faith of what sin has done to our path to God or our access to God or our closeness to God, right? It is actually spoken of by Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. I think, let's see. It's chapter 16 in the Gospel of Luke. That's the story of uh, Lazarus, the poor man, and the rich man. And it talks there, and you'll be like, I don't even remember that story. So you can go check it out, Luke chapter 16. But they talk about there about how our wealth or our poverty, um, neither one of them are what connect us with God, but our wealth has more reason to disconnect us from God than our poverty does. But it talks about that, and it says that the disconnect is a chasm 
between us. In fact, it says that the poor man has gone to um, heaven, the kingdom realm, and the rich man, because his richness has corrupted him, has been separated from the heavenly realm. And he says, can you just let him touch his finger in the water and give me a drink? It's really hot here. (laughs) And uh, the response is, there's a chasm between you. There it is. The chasm of sin, right? There it is. It doesn't just get talked about there. And um, Dante was a writer in, um, in Renaissance and early literature, and um, Dante wrote The Inferno, and it talks a lot about the heavenly kingdoms and the kingdoms below. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. But in saying that, he also describes a chasm of sin. I've got to get you guys saying it with me so it has more power. I'm not that powerful on my own, but anyway. Um, but so he talks about it as well, this chasm of sin. And then it's also when, if you ever attended any Billy Graham events, some of you remember when they were crusades, some of you remember when they were missions, some of you just remember him as that old guy on TV. Regardless, Billy Graham would often use this illustration as the, the valley or the cliff that we have to cross to get to God, right? And it is basically, essentially, the chasm of sin. And that's not the end of it, because also in Youth for Christ, when Youth for Christ is working in colleges and talking with students about what it means to come to a relationship with God, they talk about how in our lives there are things that just weigh us down and things that distract us and things that overwhelm us and things... Um, that tempt us and things that invite us into things that are not good for us. And they talk about that as the chasm of sin, right? It's all over our faith journey. It's all over the stories we are taught about what it means to be um, in relationship or really lacking in relationship with God. Because that's the essence of what sin is the essence of what happened in the fall, the essence of why we need Jesus Christ, the essence of why, why God took the effort to get, send Jesus Christ in this world. Because between us, human beings, and God our creator, the one who created us in his image and created us in perfect alignment with him, and from whom we stepped away so that we could have our own way in our own path. There is a chasm. There's a space. There's a separation. That's actually how Paul usually describes it, and it's really how he describes it here. Now, it takes him a while. He starts off with the promise, and that's where we will end up today, but he, he does speak of, well, the chasm. So I want to um, invite you to hear that again. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Does that sound kind of like a desolate chasm? Yeah. You were following the course of this world. There's that temptation and the stuff that looks good to us. You were following the ruler of the power of air, not the heavenly kingdoms, but of this world, right? The spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. There's that chasm is a disobedience to the path that God has called us to and asked us to be a part of. All of us once lived among these passions of the flesh. We did the will of our flesh and our senses. We were by nature children of wrath, like anyone else. See, this isn't just a you thing, this sin. It's not just a you thing. It's an all of us thing. We all have between us and God this chasm that is the sin within us and around us and among us, right? That's what we have. Yet, we have a God who did not create us with that in mind. God did not create us and say, gee, I think I will create a chasm of sin to separate them from me. No, that's not what God did. God created us in his image and in his likeness and in relationship with God. And then gave us free will. He said, but I want them to choose me. I want them to choose the relationship that we have, this perfection that we have with each other. I want them to choose that. And so here is free will. And we went, 
That is awesome. Oh, wait. That seems so great, God squirrel. We did that. And we got distracted by our free will and our ability to choose. And so what happens is the more we choose these other paths, the wider the chasm becomes, right? And the deeper and the craggier and the darker and the scarier. And you're like, I still don't hear the hope in this message, Pastor. But I got it for you already. Because here's what comes next. But God, because there you go, God, who is rich in mercy, thank goodness for that, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, uh, made us alive together with Christ. And says, by grace you have been saved. He raises up with him and seated him, us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So no more chasm for us. No more chasm. The reason that I brought up Youth for Christ, those other stories also use the chasm of sin concept, but Youth for Christ uh, uses this brilliant picture, right? And you've probably seen it if you do much of this surfing around in Christian context or have been in Christian context much in your life. Or maybe we're brought to Jesus by Youth for Christ. That could happen too. But they have this beautiful image where there is this beautiful landscape here. And there's this monstrous cliff here. And here we stand on the cliff, right? That's where we stand. And this monstrous chasm on the edge of the cliff is just darkness and sin and temptation and failure and hurt and damage and all of that is mixing around in this valley. And that's the first image. Who we are and who we might be. And then they give this other image below. And it says who we can be because of what God has done and because we've chosen to let God do it for us. And across that chasm is a cross. And the reality is the cross does that work. The cross does that work for us, right? That which separated us from God is our sin, washed clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. That which kept us separated from God, that is our humanness, sacrificed on the cross by Jesus Christ. That which kept us doomed, the loss of eternal life, restored in the resurrection. God did all of that work. God took care of all of those things that created this, separate, this separation that we created. God said, okay, I got a bridge. I can get you over the gap. Are you ready? Here you go. Jesus the Christ, he's going to come to this world. He's going to teach you. He's going to love you. He's going he's to die for you. But he is going to live for you as well. And so because of that offering that God gives us, we have this possibility to say, hey, look, there is a path across the chasm of sin, and it is a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's an amazing gift, isn't it? You don't have to hang out in the chasm of sin. You can journey to a relationship with God through Jesus Christ and the cross upon which he died. You can take that step. I pray you have taken that step. If you haven't taken that step, I invite you today, talk to me, talk to one of our leadership team, talk to one of our worship leaders. Let's let's help you begin that journey on that cross, across that chasm, to be in relationship with God. That is what Paul is talking about today. He is talking about that cross that has covered the chasm and the relationship with God that we are invited into by the very offering of the cross and the gift of resurrection in Jesus Christ. But it doesn't stop there. And so I want you to hear the next piece. Because God prepared this way of life by faith, right? He didn't say, oh, uh, by the way, here's the checklist of what you need to accomplish for me to offer you the cross. No, God didn't do that. 
God did not say, by the way, you have to accomplish 13 good acts of kindness and 14 acts of service and say nine prayers between now and tomorrow in order for that cross to remain intact, right? No, he didn't do that either. The next thing that Paul reminds us of is that this is all accomplished by what God did. And the act that we live out is faith. That's, that's, that's what we got to do. We got to have faith. We've got to believe. We've just got to have faith. Can, do you think that that sounds overwhelmingly hard? I mean, in the grand scheme of things, there's not a checklist. There's not a hard list of things to do. There's not actions that you need to take. You simply need to, in your very being, say, you know, I believe that God wanted a relationship so much with me that he built that bridge for me across the chasm, that he completed a path across the gap that is between us and God, that God already did that. That's what God wants from you. A yes, I believe. And so I invite you today to, to reestablish that, that moment where you say, yes, I believe that God, God invites me into relationship again. God invites me to walk safely across the chasm of sin and death into perfect relationship with God. And now I could stop there. That's a pretty good message, right? It's a pretty amazing thing that God's done right there. And I could stop right there. But today I give you that. Because that separation is, is because of us, right? The separation that we experience with God isn't because of something God did. No, God created us in his image, gave us the perfect plan. We created the separation. And each and every day, our sin, it's still a part of us. So it's easy to get back into that separate mode, right? Well, I'm going to be really good in relationship with God because I got church today. But I got stuff tomorrow. <laughs> I'm going to have a really good relationship with God as I'm sitting reading my Bible on Tuesday. But Thursday night, I don't work Friday, so I'm going out. And, well, God doesn't need to show up. You see how that goes? Separation. We choose the separation. God did not pick the separation. We did. We are the ones that said, hmm, let's chip away at that little, that little divot and make it a chasm, Right? We did that. But God said, I, I know you did that. I see you did that. I see all that you put in that chasm. I got that. But here you go. Here, here still is the cross. Here still is your path across the gap that sin creates. Here is still your way of connecting with me. Still come and be in relationship with me. God did that. And so my question for you today is, are you minding the gap? You see, I love that. Um, when I, I actually had to look it up because I'm like, well, I went to, when did I first go to England? And I was like, oh, I, I think I was in high school, maybe I was in college, I don't know. I've been, I've been to England a number of times in my journey. My favorite was when I went to see uh, the, the Wesley Church, the Methodist Church that's there in London. And I'm like, look at that, it's the actual, like, the Methodist Church, the one. And then I went to Aldersgate Street and it seemed so much more powerful than some fancy building in downtown. So anyway, but that being said, I've been to London a number of times, and the thing that I always find entertaining, because we do spend some time there in the subway, right? The tube, as they call it, or the underground. We spend some time there, and on every platform, since 1966, it says that. Mind the gap. Because I don't know if you've ever been on a subway. If you haven't, here's how it works. There's you, and then there's this massive chasmous ditch with an electrical current running through it <laughs> that keeps the trains moving, right? And if you step off, <laughs> you ain't gonna make it. <laughs> and also, there's a space between the train and the edge, right? And it, it's something you could get caught in, especially when we had those cool platforms in the 60s. I don't know. But that's the thing. They had this great ad campaign to try and save people from falling off the tracks and getting struck between the trains in their fancy shoes by saying, mind the gap. 
And they still have it today. If you go, they say all the time, and mind the gap, mind the gap. Pay attention to the space between you and the chasmus electrical rail below. Pay attention to the gap that is right there, obvious before you. And that's what I want to challenge you with today. Because you see, that chasm between us and God, we created that. God did, and God created the path across it. But the way that we continue to have that cross to close the gap for us is that we mind the gap. We pay attention. We, we actually pursue a relationship with God that can keep the cross across the gap for us. That's the invitation that Paul has in these words for us today. Because it'd be really easy to say, oh, look, just like Paul said, God did the work. Whew, we're done. But we got to mind the gap. John Wesley used the word uh, sanctification or sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace is the love of God that exists to continue to nurture you once you've said yes to God. It's the work of the Holy Spirit continuing to pour into you, to draw you closer to God when you've said yes to God. And so today I want you to sit in the midst of your covered chasm by the cross of Jesus and ask yourself this. Am I minding the gap? Am I paying attention to my relationship with God so the cross stays sturdy in place so that I have easy access to God? I have a close relationship with God. Am I asking God to continue pouring in his sanctifying grace? You know you have homework, right? And that's your homework for today. I want you to look at your life this week and mind the gap between you and the perfection of God, between you and your relationship with God. This week, go into the world and mind the gap, people. That's what you're invited to do. Let's pray. Gracious God, today, we thank you for just that, your grace. You have poured out your grace upon us in ways that are redeeming and restoring, that are sustaining. Lord God, what a gift you are. Yeah, Lord, there's a lot of stuff going on in our lives. There's a lot of pieces and parts moving at all times, and it's really easy to notice all the pieces and parts in the movement and lose sight of who you are in and who we are as your child, as your beloved as one made in your image. And so, God, help us to mind the gap of sin between us and your perfection. Help us mind and keep mindful of your grace, that your grace may cover all that is between us and you. That, Lord, we may be day in and day out, moment by moment, restored to you and redeemed by the power and the blood and the promise of Jesus Christ. Lord, we give our gifts of prayer to you, and we pray them all in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Stand if you like to pray. They switched mics on me before service, and I didn't know which channel I was in.
All right, we've been sitting for a few, so if everybody could stand and kind of stretch up a little bit. Oh, yes. And please join me in singing our closing song today as we take out worship with My Hope Is You. Let my enemies triumph over me. My hope is in you. Show me your ways. Guide me in truth. And all my days, my hope is. I am, oh Lord, filled with your love. You are, oh God, my salvation. God, my life and rescue me. My broken spirit shouts. My men. Heart cries out, my hope is in you. Show me your ways, guide me in truth, and all my days, my hope is you. of life and you give hope when hope seems gone bend our lives and set us free watching over all pouring out your grace my hope our first meeting on July 30th, so I hope that you will talk to some of those people. Let us know how we're doing as we make this pastoral transition, and let us know some of your hopes and dreams. We also want to let you know that we have church t-shirts now on sale! So you can get your t-shirt for $10 today. Please buy one. Let's move those on. We also want to let you know that we have a connection gathering in the Central District 
It is Saturday, August 10th. I'm going to be there. My husband's going to be there. Our superintendent's going to be there. There's going to be fun times and good workshops. And so if you would like to connect with some other people in the central district of the United Methodist Church, that is a great opportunity to do that. I know you probably can't get that QR code while we're moving here in worship, but there is one on the bulletin board in the hallway, or you can also talk to me after church, and I would be happy to just add you to my registration. But let's drive over together, and let's have a good time. Um, those are the things that we have before you today. But most of all, the thing we have before us today is the opportunity to walk into the world in that relationship with God that has been made ours through Jesus Christ. So go in the grace and the hope and the promise of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.